Well, hi! Before I got into physics, I studied finance and economics. And people I talked to, when they learn of this fact before I got into physics, I, I did finance. They often ask me, wow, that's pretty different. Uh, how did that change come about? And usually my reply is, well, they're not that different really. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of physicists and their prevalence in finance and also try to provide some examples of why physics and finance are actually quite similar, at least the methods employed within the two disciplines. So let's get into it. Most of the people who watch my videos are actually not subscribed, so if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. It's absolutely free and you can always unsubscribe. The easiest way to show you that the things you do in computational finance and computational physics are very similar is just by looking at the contents of a couple of textbooks. So here I have two content descriptions or content lists, right? And you will immediately see that a lot of the, the topics, they are similar. For instance, you have numerical integration and Monte Carlo methods in the same books. And you have the bisection method is mentioned both places and the newton raphson method is mentioned both places and so on. So this would lead one to believe there is some sort of similarity going on, right? You might have heard that a lot of physics PhDs are actually doing jobs in finance. And this started uh, some time ago at the height of the Cold War. You've probably heard of the arms race and the space race, but there was also a certain kind of general science race going on between the, the East and the, and the West or the US and the USSR. I think that many scientists or many, many people in general felt that it was their patriotic duty to do the best for their country and then opted for a career in, in science to build up the country and their technology essentially, right? And this desire for people to stay in science and physics and pursue academic careers to sort of help their country resulted in uh, professorships being taken up for an entire generation, right? So there, you hear stories about uh, researchers or physicists that actually did several postdocs or stayed on as freebies and did work for free in the hope of someday publishing a revolutionary paper or something that would grant them that professorship that they, they wanted. Because many people didn't succeed or weren't successful in, in getting a job in, in academia. They they went elsewhere and a lot of physicists, they realized that their skills were actually very well applied in finance. And if you want to read more about this, I would highly recommend uh, the book by Emmanuel Derman called My Life as a Quant. It's a great book, it's a biography. This guy, Emmanuel Derman, he, he started in physics, did research, he was at Oxford, if I remember correctly, and then got a job eventually working for Goldman Sachs, one of the largest investment banks uh, building financial models. And he's a professor at uh, Columbia now, I believe. I will link to the book in the description below so you can buy it if you'd like to. This led to the emergence of what we call quants, uh, or people that do quantitative analysis in financial firms and investment banks. So quants, they are essentially people with a non-finance background or a, an education outside of finance that does works in a, a financial firm. Uh, for instance, they're usually mathematicians, physicists, but also uh, computer scientists or statisticians and, and stuff like that. Many large investment banks have at least some of these people, some quants. And of course, there are also wealth managers and money managers or, or hedge funds that specialize in quantitative models and quantitative techniques. Perhaps the best example is uh, James Simon's Renaissance Technologies, which have averaged a more than 70% return in using only quantitative models, which is perhaps the best in the world. Okay, so let me try to illustrate some similarities between certain areas of physics and finance. And let me talk first about Brownian motions. Now, Brownian motions were named after Robert Brown. He was uh, a Scottish botanist and he studied small pieces of pollen and how they moved or dissolved quite randomly in, uh, in the water. This was around uh, 1827, I believe. The movement of pollen in water is not deterministic. The movement is cha chaotic and erratic, rather. Such movements have since been named after Robert Brown and is uh, today called Brownian mo motions. You might, might have heard of it. Now, the first real succinct description of Brown emotions was made by Louis Bachelier around the 19, 1900 or something like that. But he actually applied this theory of Brownian uh, motions in modeling 
stocks on the Paris Stock, Stock Exchange. And this guy, Louis Bachelier, he is considered the forefather of uh, financial mathematics. His doctoral dissertation has the uh, very fitting name, Théorie de la Spéculation. Five years later, Einstein, in one of his great seminal papers, realized that you can use these Brownian motions and sort of translate this microscopic property of particles moving in water or whatever, and then link it to a macroscopic uh, property. Use Brownian motions to describe diffusion. So imagine if you have several or two substances as two liquids with different types of particles that are mixing. You could describe each particle as a Brownian motion, but the macroscopic property or how the two, two fluids mix, you could describe with diffusion equations. And this is what Albert Einstein did in one of his 1905 Mirac Miraculous Year papers. And he actually used this to describe both the size of an atom and also the, the size or how large a mole was. So now I'd like to show you a small example of how these brown emotions may look like. The simplest brown emotion is brown emotion in one dimensional and a discrete motion. So you have discrete time steps and you, um, you say that they move a random uh, distance uh, at each time step in one dimension. So here I have plotted uh, these such systems or entities or auto autonoma or whatever you call them with the time along the x-axis and you see the value that they take or the position their coordinates on the the y-axis okay so you can already see that the simplest brown in motion in one dimension where you also store the information in time sort of looks like like stock prices right so already we see some sort of, i don't know qualitative likeness between our two fields here now we can also move to 2D and here we see that as the particle moves more and more we see that there's a larger probability for the particle being further from the origin. So you would say that okay expected position of the particle over time would always be centered at the, the starting point as long as you don't have any drift terms or say this was actually a piece of pollen or a pollen particle moving in water. But if the water was without any current or anything like that, we would assume that the starting point would be the expected position over all time. Let's run one more. Another thing that we see quite easily is that after more and more time has passed, the probability to find a pollen particle or a particle of any kind farther from the point of origin uh, where you initially place it gets larger. So at some certain point away from the initial position, the probability that you find it that far away would increase as time increases as well. So this is what diffusion is and how you could go from the movement of individual particles and then translate that microscopic pro property to the macroscopic pro property, which is what, what Einstein did. This sort of random movement becomes more and more important later on, where you apply this these techniques of simulating individual behaviors of individual pieces of the systems as a means to say something about the system as a whole and this is called Monte Carlo methods Monte Carlo methods they were invented by Stanislav Ulam a mathematician that worked on the uh, Manhattan project and he came up with this idea while he was recovering from surgery and he was uh, playing solitaire. He had the idea to what if we can make a computer play thousands of uh, solitaire games and then we could see some sort of distribution of what would happen depending on the initial configuration. Of course one of the first electronic computers in the world, ENIAC, made such studies possible to do. The, the reason they're called Monte Carlo methods is because uh, Stanislav had an uncle that just had to go to Monte Carlo to, to gamble. So that's where the name is from gambling. The simplest example to illustrate what the Monte Carlo method is, is if you imagine that you want to compute the expected number of, of ice that you see when you roll a six-sided die. Now, if you know something about probability theory, you could calculate this and you'd, you'd know that the, uh, the, the, the value or the expected value is 3.5. You would never actually get 3.5, but as you add up all your dice throws 
and then divide them by the number of dice throws, you could also compute the average, right? And this is exactly what the Monte Carlo method is. We could do this on a computer, ask the computer to throw a die a million times, and then compute the average. So let's do it. Start the simulation, and we see that 10, thro 10 throws, that's pretty bad. 100 throws, we are quite close actually. And then we see that after we add more and more throws, or ask the computer to do this, luckily the computer doesn't complain too much. As we get to a very large number, then we see that we are very close to 3.5, which is the correct expected value. On Monte Carlo methods, they are very powerful and they're used in physics and finance and engineering and all kinds of stuff. In 1973, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes made what is called the Black Scholes model. A somewhat unanswered problem in finance up to this point was how do we price stock options? And their Black Scholes model did this very well. But before we get into more about this model and to show that this is actually a diffusion model, I'm going to talk just briefly about stock options so we sort of know what that is. So financial derivatives, even though many people think of them as a very new thing, is actually a very old thing. Perhaps one of the earliest descriptions of a financial derivative comes from uh, Thales of Miletus, a uh, Greek philosopher and mathematician and, you know, scientists back in those days, they were everything had every profession. And this was around 600 BC or, or something like that. And the tale goes that Thales, he purchased the right to use the olive presses. And, you, and not only one olive press, but all the olive presses in the entire village. And, and when people came to try to get their olives pressed to make olive oil, he had the rights to use all of them. So this was sort of the earliest example of a stock option, or not a stock option, but an olive press option that gives the, the owner of the option a right, but not a duty to either buy or sell an underlying asset. Okay, so you have what you call calls and you have puts. Calls are options to buy and puts are options to sell. And uh, they can be, the underlying asset could be anything, but uh, usually it's, it's a stock that trades on an exchange. So for instance, I could purchase an option that gives me the right to purchase shares or stocks or whatever you call them in American Airlines, for instance. And I usually have to do this within a specified date. And I also have to purchase the, the stocks at a specified price called the strike price. Okay, so I have the right to buy a certain amount of shares within a certain date to a certain price. If I buy stock options, which has a strike price at 100, say, and American Airlines shares, they rise to 112, then those options would be in the money. They would actually have intrinsic value because then I would be able to purchase stocks at a lower price than the market price. Now back to the Black Scholes model. Here it is. And what's very fascinating about this model is that even though it may not seem like it, it is actually a diffusion equation. So the same sort of insight that you can model stock prices as brown in motions and then add them all up to get this diffusion behavior is, is, is what really unique here. And that's the same thing that, that Einstein realized when he made his diffusion models. So what you could actually do, you could start off with a diffusion equation and then add some simple transfer transformations and then voila, you get the Black-Scholes equation. There are physicists all over the finance world in, in investment banks that use this equation or, or models similar to it to price stock options. So to sort of sum up, what can physicists bring to the table in a finance world? Well, Physicists today usually know how to program. All physicists should be computational physicists. Physicists are also trained in solving, solving somewhat complex uh, models and systems. And a lot of the methods they use can also be applied in finance because what you do both in finance and in physics is really to solve differential equations. And physicists are also very good at managing large data sets. What one should note, however, models in physics and models in finance are quite different beasts. 
While a model in, in physics or a natural law may work perfectly all the time, in finance, because there are actually people that do trades in the stock market and so on, and people have feelings, they can panic and they can feel greed and so on. That's what you usually say, that fear and greed is the things that rule the financial market. The models usually are built on assumptions that do not, do not always hold. So one can say that the finance uh, world or scientific finance uh, suffers from the disease of physics envy because it tries to model a system precisely with mathematics that does not always work as it does in physics. A very good illustration of this is during the financial crisis in what was it 2007 and 2009 where a hedge fund manager reported 25 sigma events uh, but that means that they are seeing events that within the scope of their models never ever happen during the entire lifetime of the universe. And they saw this several days in a row. When they discovered the Higgs boson at CERN, they set a significant level at five sigma or five standard deviations from, from the mean to be sure that this was not some random noise in the machinery, right? When you are at a five sigma significant level, that means that to measure what they're measured by random chance, would only happen in one in 3.5 million of the cases. For someone to say that we are seeing 25 standard deviation events would mean that this would happen one out of 1.3 times 10 to the power of 135 is just completely ludicrous. Remember this guy, the inventor of the Black-Scholes model? Well, he built a hedge fund and you would think that Nobel Prize winners in finance, which he was, would, would do this kind of well, but he, but he fell vic victim to this problem, that he didn't have models that functioned outside of a normally behaving market. So when there was a financial crisis in Russia, I believe, his, the, their models in their fund couldn't cope with it, and they went bankrupt. The story is told in this aptly named book, When Genius Fade. Also a great book, which I will link to in the description. That's it for me today. I hope that you, you learned something and that this was illustrative. Coming up very soon, I hope, uh, I haven't really planned it out yet, uh, but I hope to be able to make a, a series of videos where I actually implement a diffusion equation solver and then also adjust it to solve the Black-Scholes equation.